Anyway, I'll kick. I'll kick right off. Um, you should uh, be looking at uh, a conference call. Some conference call charts on your uh, screen. They were also sent out, so maybe you have them in front of you. So I will loosely go through them. Um, but the fact of the matter is, I have. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I'd like to cover for you today, and most of it, as you can imagine, doesn't have anything particularly to do with a chart or with something that's going on in the economy right now I and mean, I'll, I'll go through some of that but you know a lot of it is about the ECB a lot of it is about Italy and 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 so the eurozone in general and what's going on um, and and so these kind of themes kind of are a little bit detached from the charts but be that as it may in um, if you look at the the first I mean the, my economic story in a nutshell this year is that I think economic growth is slowing. I think economic growth is slowing probably a little bit faster than the consensus expects, but I think that as I say this and as we get the staff projections from the ECB next week, I would expect the consensus to have now caught up with the idea that growth in the Eurozone is most certainly not going to be as strong this year as it was last year. Um, if you look at chart number one and two, I try to kind of encapsulate this in two. Uh, real money growth is slowing, which points to lower real GDP growth. And uh, in chart number two, I show that my forecasts are still a little bit lower than the consensus, but I would actually expect the consensus to, to move in line with, uh, with, with my forecast, perhaps even go a little bit lower. I mean, my own forecasts are certainly also at risk of being downgraded a little bit. Uh, just a word on the real money chart. I mean, I, I, I get a lot of questions on this because it, it, it um, because th there is some skepticism about this. But even if you don't believe this chart, I mean, I'm sure if you just look at the surveys, for example, you can say they've come down quite a lot. So there's a plethora of evidence to suggest that the, the um, economic growth in the eurozone has slowed um, at the start of the year. Well, we already got the Q1 data from. Um, on the on the GDP accounts, which were lower, but throughout the year, I think it's safe to assume that the growth is going to slow from a high level of about 2.7% uh, at the end of last year to about 2% this year. So that's the that's the baseline story. Um, if I told you this uh, six months ago, uh, you know that that might have had some value. But like I said, in in so far as growth, I think the consensus is now catching up with this. So I think this is the base case. That then brings me over to the Q2 story, which I actually think could be quite good. Um, um, GDP growth in, in the first quarter slowed quite dramatically, but we see signs in Q2, especially in some of the key data, such as industrial production and retail sales and consumer spending, that base effects are quite positive uh, with respect to a, a rebound. So what does this mean in, in terms of, of your world? Well, um, there's been a lot of discussion about the macroeconomic surprise indices in the eurozone in the last couple of months because there were about 80 at the end of um, at the end of 2017, and now in the first six months of this year they've actually absolutely collapsed. If I'm right, they're going to come out, up a little bit in the second quarter um, as as the data comes out a little bit better. Uh, this week we get some uh, manufacturing data from uh, for April in um, in France and in Germany, and I, I expect to to see signs of that there. So that's kind of the headline economic story, um, which is in some sense now a little bit detached from everything else that's going on because the economic data is kind of like doesn't move as fast as events does in asset markets and that's kind of and so how to marry these two things that's kind of I suppose what, what you'll be thinking about at the moment but insofar as goes the economic story I think that's the that's that's what we're looking at at the moment. Uh, slower growth over the year as a whole, but perhaps in Q2, I think as the hard data comes in, we should expect actually a little bit of a bounce off of a low base effects in um, in in the first quarter. On the inflation side, again, we because the inflation analysis effectively allows us to to then move into what the ECB is doing. And obviously, already today, there's been a lot. Of, there's been some some news out in terms of, of what's going to happen next week, but. The inflation story in the eurozone is basically, I would say that you know, I, I wrote that, in a, I think, and I wrote that in a data note earlier last 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 week that you know the cat is out of the bag. Uh, headline inflation in the eurozone is is uh, surging. We could we've seen this coming miles away from from the energy prices, and this is now happening. If you look at chart number number five, uh, we can see the energy prices are now rising about six to seven percent year over year. That will continue in the next couple of months, and that should be enough to push. Headline inflation in the eurozone above two percent. Obviously, the ECB has conditioned everyone in the marketplace to look through headline inflation, but I still think it's at the margin. It's an 
important point to mention because it will help them, I think, to make the decision everyone now expects them to make, namely that QE will end at some point uh, this year. I'll come back to that in a very, very short moment in terms of exactly what I expect there. But I, again, expect headline inflation in the Eurozone to print above 2% in the next couple of months and then to ease gradually towards 1.5% at the end of the year. Um, again, forecast can be wrong, but in this case, I'd say that actually a lot of this is already baked in, 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 into these data. So it, we shouldn't have any huge surprises from these data. On the core inflation side, it's it's a big, we have a big divergence at the moment between services inflation, which is rising, volatile, but rising, and, and, and selling price expectations in the services sectors are also trending up. So that makes me a little bit more confident that, um, that services inflation is increasing. But services inflation in the Eurozone is only 60% of the CPI. 40% of the CPI is made up of non-energy goods inflation. And that remains very low. I have been say, telling readers and investors this year that I expect headline inflation to go to about 1.3 to 1.4 percent. I was a little bit more positive at the in the beginning of the year, 1.5. But as goods inflation has failed to rebound, I've had to kind of draw, come back a little bit from that. And again, here as we sit at the midpoint of the year, I look at these data, and uh, right now I need goods inflation to come up. Uh, and if I need it, other forecasters need this as well to 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 you know fulfill the the, the idea that core inflation um, will increase to about 1.3, 1.4 percent at the end of the year. It is not enough, I think, service inflation to go higher. Obviously, if service inflation goes to 2.5 or something like that and stays there, that would be enough. But I think that perhaps is a little bit unrealistic. So as long as core, uh, so, sort of non-energy goods inflation remains at this level. I'm a little bit worried that core inflation will not get there. The PPI index suggests that non-energy goods inflation will um, will increase soon. The only plausible explanation, really, for why it's so weak, even though growth has been decent, is the lack effect of a stronger euro, which is fading. I would say now, as the euro is weakening a little bit, but the lags between non-energy goods inflation and the euro are so long and they vary by so much that anyone who walks into your office and tells you that they're 100% sure that, that the euro is now affecting non-energy good inflation, I would take that message with a huge heap of salt because it's very, very uncertain exactly how this affects this, uh, how this affects over time. Durable goods inflation is the one that's mostly affected by it as far as I can see, but it's, it is, it's not easy to draw a, a, a strict line with this, especially not with statistical analysis. So in the next couple of months, I will be watching non and I will be watching non-energy goods inflation very closely because that's kind of that's what we need. And that's also again what the ECB needs to get core inflation higher. So what's going on with the ECB? Well, today we got, I would say, uh, we got some some indication from ECB official Peter Pratt, and we got some some Bloomberg headlines as well from Peter uh, from Jens Weidmann. Uh, that next week's meeting is live in so far as goes the next next week's meeting very well could be a meeting where they will actually signal something concrete in terms of, uh, of QE, uh, what's going to happen with QE. And I think the key story here is that no matter what happens with headline and core inflation and the story that I've just told everyone about core inflation mm, might be still struggling to go up here and certainly it's still very low, right? 1.1% we're far from um, you know, the target of 2%. When it comes to the decision on QE, it doesn't matter. Now, it doesn't matter because I think there's now a, a majority on the governing council uh, that wants out of QE. I would like to show the market that it can that it can end QE without the world falling apart. Another another aspect of this discussion, quite simply, is that the consensus, which has been telling markets, or which has been telling everyone, you know, the consensus expectation market has have been that QE would end this year via some kind of paper between September and December. And this, this consensus has survived a lot of beating, right? It's, it's survived the slowdown um, and um, in, in the first quarter and that sort of economic slowdown. And as far as I can see, it's also survived the, um, the, the volatility spike in Italian bond yields this week. So that tells you something. And, I, and the ECB, in some sense, I think in, in this context, we should consider the ECB to be a consensus taking institutions, so if the market gives them this and says, look, we still expect the end of QE, they'll take it. So 
again, as we sit here now, you know, the road is now clear for the for the ECB to end QE uh, via a, a taper. I expect a three month taper between September and uh, and December. Next next week's meeting certainly is more live than I initially expected. So you know we should expect something there, but at least but even if we don't, you know we can split hairs about July or June. But you know we'll know we'll know soon enough. I think what they're going to do, and I think they're going to conform to the consensus. Again, everybody, I think, um, will will be absolutely okay with this. The big battle is on rates. So here's what's happened on, on in terms of, of, of the interest rate story for next year. Uh, the, uh, the consensus among economists has moved a little bit. It moved after the, uh, the slowdown in Q1, where um, at the start of the year, I think everyone expected the deposit rate to be zero at the end of next year. That was then moved uh, back. That was then moved a little bit so that the consensus expected the deposit rate to be minus 0 0.1. And now I think the consensus probably is that uh, the deposit rate will be minus 0 0.2 at the end of next year, which is to say they'll get something off, but they won't manage to normalize the deposit rate. I would. This is my interpretation of the of the economists' consensus. I've just filled in a Bloomberg survey, and I think the the result of those uh, surveys will come out. That survey will come out later this week, so we'll see. Um, but I think that's the economics consensus. That's also my expectation. I have no again. Um, I have I have no on this particular story. I have no right now. I have no objection being. Uh, I, have, I have no reason to be very much outside the consensus here. Uh, in order for me to change my calls, I've been very clear on this. Or otherwise, I will be now. I need. I want to see a further slowdown in in leading indicators, and then I think we can we can start talking about the fact. That um, that they won't do get anything off next year on rates, we, or basically we, that they'll strike a deal with markets, which they've done before the ECB, which is basically to say, listen, we're going to end QE, but then as, in order to kind of offset the effect of that, we're going to wait a very long time until we think about moving rates and so like stretching the forward guidance, as it were. Markets, this is to say, market in, implied interest rates uh, based on futures have run well ahead of the story. They're almost pricing in nothing next year, at least if you look at the uh, ED, EDCs and the Euro dollar futures. It's a little bit, uh, sorry, the uh, Euribor futures. It's a little bit different if you look at some of the other uh, markets on Bloomberg. So there's a little bit of it. I think actually if you look at the, some of the uh, interest rate probability functions on Bloomberg, that those data still have uh, rate hikes beginning at some point in the middle of next year, which again, which would, would bring it more closely to what I think is the general consensus. but just to say the consensus have moved. And one story which I have been very, very specific about telling everyone that I've been speaking to in the last month and which I will be very careful in, in, in conveying in exactly the same way here is that no matter whether you believe the story I just say, and this is, I just told you, and this, this is to say whether you believe the consensus or not, you are going to hear a lot of different stories from Eurozone economists in the next six to 12 months. And this is a key, key change because up until this point, Eurozone economists, this is to say me and everyone else that does this, we've been a little bit like drones because we haven't been able to, to switch our calls a lot on the interest rates because the ECB has just been telling us, listen, we're not gonna do anything. That's part of the plan. That's why you have forward guidance. You know, when you have forward guidance, the central bank basically locks the consensus down and says, listen, don't bother, we're not gonna move rates. But once you start touch, once you start getting into an environment where you have to change the language in this, what does an extended period mean? All these kind of things, you get more volatility in rates, um, and and in and, and more volatility in consensus forecasts, and therefore, or in, in in economists and markets forecasts, and therefore, you should also see more vol more volatility in market based interest rate expectations. So, be cognizant of that shift. That's all I'm saying, right? So we, you know, I can have a discussion. We can have a discussion whether I'm right or wrong, or whether I'm on, on the right or the wrong side of the consensus at any point in time. That's I'm always have to do that. I'm, you know, that that's 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 why I'm here to some extent. But I'm also here to some extent to tell you about a shift in the market in general. I would I would I think that's really important um, to uh, to emphasize uh, um, that that. I think that's very important to to make clear that that I think it's what's gonna what's gonna happen. And as I just and and if you juxtapose this 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 race discussion with the discussion on QE, I think we can just say that the battle is now on race, right? Nobody, I mean, QE, listen, I mean, everybody knows QE is going to end or, or kind of recognize that QE is going to end. And in any case, QE is this program which it can end, 
it can be started later i mean you know but it's for now it's it's it they've they've uh, they've reduced the pace for a while and they're going to um they're going to uh to uh, to shut it down at the end of this year but it's on rates and how far they can go on rates uh, and and how quickly i think it's uh, it's the key story but then immediately you know as as if this wasn't complicated enough that then immediately takes us uh into uh the story of of draghi and benoit Coré, and in terms of who's gonna replace those two key figures i mean once what i've been telling people is that i don't think it's going to be weidman and uh, which is a massive cop-out because i don't really have any better <laughs> suggestions to uh, to who it would be i think weidman is still the front runner I think Villeroy and Philip Lane as well are, are, are good candidates, although I'm actually not sure, as I say this, whether Philip Lane is already co uh, confirmed as, as chief economist, which obviously then can't be, um, take the president's role. But I think around that, but if this is Europe, uh, we, could, we could get a candidate or a, or a final president coming in from, from, from left of center. Um, it's a political decision. It's a hugely political decision. And especially now with everything that's going on in Italy, uh, it's it, it is it is a massive uh, political decision about who's going to come in. But my but I will I will I will say two things about this appointment. Um, my imp my impression is and my expectation is that no matter who comes in, he or she will have to follow the lines that Draghi has laid in the sense that it makes no sense for someone to come in and suddenly change. Uh, the, the 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 whole story that will be very difficult. Maybe in time, but at least in the beginning, uh, a process has now been set in motion with the NQE and, and if the QE indeed ends, which I expect, and then uh, about rates. So I think there's going to be a continuity here. The big big risk in all of this is if a new president or a new I would say ECB leadership comes in and pivots from core inflation as a target to headline inflation as a target, which is kind of the official mandate. If that happens, suddenly these persistent increases in food and energy prices and the theoretical idea that they might pass through to core inflation at some point in the future suddenly become much more important for the ECB's policy setting. And then you'll see uh, a much more, um, I think, discrete shift in, in interest rates, or we should expect that. But again, that's a risk for now. I don't think that is uh, as in the cards um, going, um, I don't think that's in the cards. Speaking of volatility and uh, in, in the rates market, obviously the huge big story is, uh, is Italy. And I, I think, you know, actually chart number 11, even though it doesn't explicitly deal with Italy, that's the chart number 12, I think that really shows you a lot of what's going on. You, you have a measured, um, interest rate you have measured investor sentiment based here on the centix but i'm sure we're going to see the same in the SETI w which have actually collapsed so obviously investors in, in you know you ask investors about this that you know you ask them fill in service they get they're very worried it looks very much like 2012 to some extent there's been talk about italy leaving the eurozone they're they're obviously concerned look at market pricing on the other hand well eurozone equities in this case they were already a little bit sucky actually they, come back a little bit but in other but in general they've been kind of um they, they've been sucky but they haven't reacted with the violence that perhaps you would have expected uh given what's going on in in, in the italian bond market so that then allows me to bring us to the the main story here which which is italy i have the chart there that for me it's the main chart the two-year yield chart is the main chart that, uh, and again I'm, I'm covering this in the report tomorrow. Um, there's been a lot of talk about um, Italy um, being sort of victim of a political decision by the ECB to buy less bonds in May and all that. I think that's just dominant teacup and quite frankly, I would just ignore that completely um, because that there's some technical reasons for that. And in any case, what we have to look at is the two year yield. Basically, there's absolutely no reason for the two year yield in Italy to be where it is now and have spiked the way it has. Uh, it is a, my view, it's a direct assault on the ECB's forward guidance, and it's a massive problem for the central bank. The problem though, or the issue for the central bank is that because it happened, has happened in a context of markets speculating that Italy would do something that might eventually lead them to leave the Eurozone, either by design or by accident, the ECB's hands have been tied. But 
th there is no reason for the Italian Junior Guild to be here unless you believe that they're going to do this BOT, uh, mini BOT issuance or something else, uh, something crazy, parallel currencies. Or something. Otherwise, you know, it's massively out of whack compared to the ECB's forward guidance. So that's where, where that's the risk par parameter for me. I don't really care about the way the 10 year is. For me, it's the two year and the spread. In this case, the deposit rate, but you could also take the spread to, uh, to Germany. So the Italian situation in this in this sense is uh, is is still, I would say, an open wound in eurozone asset markets because the two-year yield has not uh, normalized yet. In some sense, uh, it would be very easy for the ECB to crush two-year yields here. I mean, this is not a balance of payment uh, crisis as we've seen in other emerging markets at the moment. I mean, this is completely different. You know, both the eurozone and Italy runs a current account surplus, and 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 quite frankly, it would it would be very easy for the ECB to. Uh, to, to come in, uh, come in hard here. But at the moment, I still think they, I think that they're not doing it. First of all, because they don't really have a program except um, they don't really have a program except the OMT program, and um, and which is kind of like this is this conditional program. And another thing is, I think that that they might be waiting a little bit for reassurances. I mean, we heard uh, Giuseppe Conte in saying the Parliament that you know. The, obviously, it was no part of the program uh, to, to leave the Eurozone. I believe him, but what markets don't know uh, and what I don't know is that what is the incentive and or uh, propensity of the Italian government to play brinkmanship with the EU in the next 6 to 12 months, for example, just in the next six months in terms of fiscal stimulus. Because if they do that, I think the markets will not ask twice, right? The market will just say, look, listen, this is... Um, this is not uh, this is not on, and, and and so the market will sell first and ask question later. Um, if I just take you to the final slide, you know we have some I have some charts in Italy here, and obviously it shows us that Italy is uh, is, is in some sense a laggard. It shows us the reasons for why people are talking about the idea that that Italy might, you know, at some point accidentally or by own by its own decision decide to leave the eurozone. And I would just make a couple of things very very clear. First of all. I don't think that Italy is going to leave the Eurozone. I think that it, when I go to Rome in five years, I'll be paying my hotel year in, uh, in, in Euros, right? That's just, that's my baseline and you need to know this and then you can, you know, you can in, in your mind say, well, the guy's crazy, the guy's not crazy. That's my, that's my, that's my key. In between then and, and, and in between now and then, um, on a couple of things I think are important to emphasize in this situation or in the situation that we might potentially be moving into in terms of this tit-for-tat brinkmanship between the EU and Italy, which will be very, very uncomfortable. First of all, no country can be kicked out of the Eurozone. A country can only decide itself to leave the Eurozone. It's not as if Italy does something and then the rest of the European economies go and say, oh, that was very, very naughty, very, very naughty. We're now going to exclude you from the club. That's not the way it works. We know the, the way it works, however, is that if a country, especially a, if a country's government especially starts to flirt with the idea of parallel currencies or whatever it is they've been talking about, then the ECB will shut off the banking system. And uh, this is what happened to some extent in Greece. Well, in Greece, what happened was deposit outflows, right? They, they just lost all the deposit, and then, you know, that's what, what happened. That's quite unlikely, I would say, in, Greece, in Italy. I mean, there's a lot of deposits in, in, in Italy, and why I think probably some deposits are now flowing out, the most liquid and movable, like elastic deposits, I think. You know, mom and pops in Italy, they're not going anywhere. They have probably have no clue about what I'm talking about at the moment. The, you know, th this is not a story that affects them f at the moment. So I think, you know, we should, we should grade these things on a curve, but that's, that's, what gonna, that's what's going to happen. And then at this point, what normally happens is the country in question um, steps back to the brink, right? Again, we don't know the, um, what, 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 how, how tough as it is and how much support the, the Italian current Italian government has to play this kind of game. If that is indeed what they want, we don't know. But again, it is normally a game which costs a lot of political capital domestically. If, for example, suddenly um, interest rates starts to go sustainably higher and, and, and pensioners can't take money out of the ATMs, things like that. If, if it goes into that kind of situation, it might not be so easy for Salvini and De Maio just to say, oh, this is just the EU's fault. I mean, that's what we've seen historically. But I don't actually think we'll get to there because I think there's there's a benign equilibrium here in which Italy actually, in which everybody realizes Italy actually does have room to do some fiscal stimulus. But 
it would really, really help. And this is, I mean, I'm waiting to hear, to see that headline flash across the Bloomberg. I would really like to see the Italian government come out and say, listen, we're not going to do this parallel currency, mini BOT, that's like that was some that's in the dustbin. What we'll do is we'll issue 30 to 50 year BTPs. We'll do that and we'll use that to finance a universal basic income, whatever it is they want to do. That'll be all right. 10 year yields will go up, but if, if two year yields then come down because the market then realizes that, okay, they're staying in the Eurozone or whatever, that, that they're not um, about to just throw away um, the, the link to the ECB by doing something crazy, the curve steepens. And I'm pretty sure that if the curve steepens and goes to like 300 basis points or something, I'm pretty sure that domestic savers in Italy are, will be very happy with the current account surplus 3% to finance that. Like, so a steepening curve in Italy now, with, with long rates going a little bit higher, but short rates coming down. That's the benign equilibrium I'm looking for. And it's there for the taking. That's my point, it's there for the taking. But whether we get there and how long it'll take before we get to there, I don't know. The final point I mentioned on this is that um, th there's been a lot of um, talk about the June summit and the June EU summit, which has been played up. And it's been played up because I think markets are now sensing that the rest of Europe are a little bit spooked here and they are willing to give to cut Italy some slack or give Italy something either in the form of specific fiscal uh, this uh, flexibility or in in the form of moving forward with these eurozone reforms which everyone has been talking about uh, my message to you is do not get your hopes up I think a boosted ESM fund or e uh, European stability mechanism is doable. It's you know it, it'll be it'll be something it'll be classic Euro European fudge which we've seen before. It probably won't be that big, but I think it's coming. And we, we it might also be a fund that can do some investment and some basically what 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 what, it, what the way to think about it is that it's an extra cohesion and social fund only for eurozone economies, and you can have a little bit of transfers via that. But again. This is something which is going to be controlled by Germany. I mean, Germany is not just going to unconditionally throw money into this. And so, again, I think the rules, these kind of rules, still the rules about conditionality and, and, and still still are in play. Uh, the, after all, the eurozone. I wrote this the other day. The eurozone is is, is not the art of what's economically optimal, but it's what's politically possible. And I think while something is possible politically, don't get your hopes up in terms of this grand bargain. I mean, it'd be great. I mean. Wow, it'd be absolutely brilliant if it happened, but I just I'm not 100 sure. And then in in any case, history unfortunately also shows us that for something like that to happen, we need a much stronger response from bond markets. I mean, we need proper panic, uh, not only in Italy but in other markets as well, before they get to the table and agree on something like that. I mean, I, I know this is a sort of a, a little bit of a downbeat measure, but this is Europe after all. So you know, we should never really uh, get our our hopes up. I think in terms of them moving that quickly, but they'll they'll get somewhere. I think Macron has has done a good some good legwork here, and I think uh, you know there could be some good news. But yeah, don't expect too much. Right, I think I've kind of gone through all the all this sort of importance of the final two slides I have are just I really didn't have time to incorporate them in the main thing because I wanted to get the ECB the Italian thing. I want to emphasize on that, but there's a couple of stories I just wanted to, to emphasize to you in France and Germany, the two biggest economies. So first of all, in Germany, wages should really start to pick up. Now, if you look at slides number 15 and 16, they show two different measures of wages, but both of them this year really should start to pick up. The reason why nominal labor costs have come down recently in terms of growth is because of some, some technical base effects. I think that should come up again. And um, just, to then tie that into a, a short-term story, uh, the fact that I think real wage growth in Germany is actually probably going to be quite quite decent, or probably is decent as I speak. This is to say, you know, wage growth has picked up, real wage growth has picked up. I think that that's also one of the reasons why Q2 consumer spending, Q3 consumer spending in Germany will be quite strong. So just be careful. I, I know this is one of those things, you know, it's like waiting for Godot in, in Germany, but remember, this is not the the, the, the wage story which forces the ECBs to panic and suddenly, you know, they raise rates in, in very quickly. This is the wage story in Germany, which, which tells us that the German consumer actually is still in play, even though the data in the last six months have suggested otherwise. I think that's, that's the way to, um, to, uh, to narrate it. And finally, in France, there's a two, again, 
three stories here. Consumer spending really ought to pick up. I mean, again, services spending is a little bit stronger, but good spending has been quite weak recently compared to the surveys. I would expect that to come up uh, in the next couple of quarters. Um, also, if you look at slide number 19, it, it appears that the, the trade surplus with the UK is turned a corner. It really got whacked after Brexit and after the move in Euro uh, sterling, but it seems that it, it's turned a corner here, which is... Uh, I mean, nobody really looks at the French current account deficit because it's not very big. It's only 1%, but it's actually an outlier in the Eurozone now, given that everybody else runs surpluses. So I think this is this is going to uh, um, this is going to uh, to help you a little bit. Uh, this is going to help the the, the French one uh, a little bit. Um, and um, and finally um, and finally, there's the construction story in France. This is not only in France, it's also in, in, in Italy and Spain where construction is now coming up. But you know, if you look at the employment data here, it's really just a V-shaped, strong recovery in France, both in terms of output and in this case it's employment, but I could have shown another chart with output. And that's a really, really positive story. And as long as rates remain low, I think that's going to continue. And uh, again, really the good news for this story is that this story really, I mean, un unless, I mean, th this story has nothing to do with whether Italian two-year yields are X, Y, or Z. This is going to continue. This is an underlying uh, secular trend in the economy, which which will take a lot to whack. I mean, if you again, that you can have volatility in the market, and then I think these kind of things will um, will still um, will still uh, will, will still be in place. And I think that's still one of my, one of the key stories for me outside Germany in particular. That construction is now picking up in earnest. And then, so that was kind of, um, so that was that's sort of, uh, the way I, I, I just the, the final couple of points I wanted to mention here. I have a couple of questions coming in. Um, um, one question uh, is about the, um, the, um, the, the news that came out today about the, the, the ECB meeting be, next week being live. And, and the question is basically whether the ECB doesn't have an incentive to wait for July to announce these modifications because they, they, there'll be more data. Um, um, and they also in terms of, of the evolution of, of what's going on in, in Italy. Uh, yes, I agree, except that um, the news I got, we got, the, I would have said, like, if you'd asked me about this this morning, I said, absolutely, I agree. It's going to be July, June, it's going to be this model through and they're not going to say anything, except that, honestly, the, the kind of, in, with the, the signals we got today from Peter Pratt and Vi it's kind of like, they've kind of already flagged it now. I mean, and, and you know, we shouldn't ignore these kind of uh, signals uh, from the ECB. So it does seem to me that we're going to get something substantial uh, next week about what they're going to, what they're going to do. Um, they could stagger it, right? So they could say, okay, yes, QE is ending this year. Um, it'll end in a gradual paper, which, and we will announce the specifics about that in July, one September, um, or, or uh, again, they they can do so many things here. In, in so far as goes, um, in so far as goes, exactly how they announce it. But I think the key the key point to look for next week will be um, a change in language in the introductory statement about um, about QE. I think that has to be our baseline now. But otherwise, I agree with with this idea that there's, there's no cost for them in waiting for. Uh, for for what's for July to announce it. I actually think up until this morning that was also the consensus. So I think that's just, that's something which just moved very quickly actually just today. You know what? I don't think we have any more questions. So I think I'm gonna I'm gonna end the call here. I've already taken enough of your time. If you have any questions, come find me on, on the email. Please please do, or I'll have a phone call with you. And and again, thank you very much for calling in uh, and taking your time. We have a lot of calls coming out this uh, this month. Uh, with our uh, with with the other economists, so you know, make sure that you tune into them. And uh, all of them have to say is thank you very much for taking the time with me today.